A few weeks ago, I brought a message here that was relevant for the times. And we find ourselves in some difficult, challenging times. The news is not news, it's just bad news. It is things that we haven't seen before in, in politics and schools and in relationships. In fact, we discover if we look closely at it that the evil one is hard at work. And in many cases, it seems that he is winning. And in the midst of it, we realize that we are indeed in a battle. That's not just a battle, it's, an, it's a worldwide, universe encompassed war. And the message then was this means war, where we as Christians had to take a stand. We had to examine our lives and realize that we're in a fight, and that fight would occur whether we fought or not. And that was a relevant word for then. Today's message is entitled, if you look in your programs, Calling All Warriors. Calling All Warriors. I believe it was in the late 1930s as uh, conflict was breaking out throughout Europe and uh, much of the rest of the world that they came out with a poster that was an individual in a high hat and dressed in a flag, had a gray beard, kind of looked like Colonel Sanders, but he was actually uh, declaring that Uncle Sam needs you. And it was a call to individuals to enlist in the military and go and serve. Irvin, you know, you know about that. Um, but calling individuals to go and serve. And it said, calling all warriors. Today's lesson, the text for today's lesson, is taken from the book of Isaiah. A very familiar body of scripture. The book of Isaiah and the sixth verse, beginning with verse Sixth chapter, beginning with verse 1. And it reads as follows. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord standing upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with, was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with thongs from off the altar. And he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I. This means war. Here am I. Send me. To realize how we get to some places, some days, and, and times, we have to look back and to realize the road that was taken. The subject text is taken from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, when he became a prophet, in the beginning of the book of Isaiah, he received a call from God. And he answered that call. 
as he understood it. And he went about the land and, and, and talking with the people, telling all the people, the vo- I've heard from the voice of God, much like ministers today, but I've heard from the voice of God, and God has been good to you. We look out and we see people that God has been good to. God has been good to you. But you're not obeying and doing what God has directed you to do. You've been blessed in the midst of your mess. You may not think you have it bad, but look at some of the people that have it worse. You might not think you have it good, but look at some of the people that have it worse. So you've been blessed. And he went about saying, woe is you. Woe is you. You are terrible. God is going to punish you, beating you down. You go into a lot of churches nowadays, and it's, it's all, you're going to die and go straight to H-E double hockey sticks if you don't straighten up. The negative part, they say, woe is you. And he went all about very effectively telling everybody that he met, you know, you got a problem with God, and you ought to straighten up. I'm able to look at you and see the problems in you. And I can tell you, you got a problem with God, and you ought to straighten that out. Because this means war. And there's things that are terrible going on. That was in the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah. That was in the first part of a lot of lives. You're either the one saying woe or the one receiving woe. But this morning, we, as we look at this, we see some pretty striking things. You know, we talked about diving deeper. Let's dive a little deeper into this, beginning with the sixth chapter. The first thing that I would like to note is that, is anybody besides me, when you try to remember stuff, you think of something that happened at the same time that the other thing happened so that you can remember the first thing? You say, I remember this because when that happened, this happened. And we have the same thing here in this beginning of this sixth chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah, in the midst of running around telling everybody how bad they were, something happened. And that's how he remembered the other thing that happened. I remember this thing because this thing happened. And he tells us that in the year that King Uzziah died, what happened? In the year that King Uzziah died, that's when I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and mighty in that year. This significant time in my life occurred when King Uzziah died. I can go back and tell you what happened at the hospital the the day my mother died. And in your life, if you think about it, There's some stuff tied to other stuff that made it extra significant and makes you recall it as though it were yesterday. In fact, it may have been as though it were the last hour, but it has a significant impression upon you. And he said, in the year the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I really came to the realization of seeing God in that year. And the God I saw was high and lifted up. You ever see God, he's going to be high and lifted up. I'm going to tell you that right now. God was high and lifted up, mighty in power. We realize God has more power than we have. And every part of him filled the temple. Now I want to get a little deeper into this sixth chapter of Isaiah because I want to talk about these seraphims that was with him. And I know I'm running right through this. Uh, seraphims are angels. But the angels say a lot about you and I. Now remember, this is a significant time now in our lives. It's been demarked by the year that the king died, that the ruler went off to scene. The current ruler went off to scene. But there was with him seraphims and it says that these angels had six wings and with two of the wings 
they covered their eyes. And with two of the wings, they covered their feet. And with two of the wings, they did fly. Now, somebody asked me recently, what's the significance of that? I mean, I, just, I read this stuff, and I don't get it. Why are you talking about angels with six wings? And, and, and why would that be included in this body of scripture? Why is that included as we're being called to be soldiers? Why is that instructional for us? It is particularly instructional when you dive deeper into it. And you realize that these angels that had six wings covered their eyes because they didn't need to see where they were going. They moved by faith. We, when we're called, we say, where am I going? Give me a road map. I need to be able to look out the front windshield. I need to be able to share the decision about where we're going. But these seraphims, these angels, covered their eyes as a statement of faith. And we, too, need to, when we're answering the call, need to cover our eyes and say, I'm faithfully following. Lord, have mercy. That's easy to say but hard to do. One day you try it. Go in your own house. Close your eyes and try to walk around the house for an hour. People that are blind will tell you that it's not a picnic. But I, I, I promise you, if you try it, you got a lot of discipline if you can make that whole hour and not at least peek out. And don't let somebody knock on the door. You're going to open your eyes. Something comes up, you're going to open your eyes. But let's learn from this. These angels that had power, that were with God, covered their eyes. Come on, Reverend. Now, two of his, his, his wings, he covered their feet. And we said he covered their eyes as a matter of faith. They cover their feet so that they could walk in that faith, go forward in that faith. They didn't need to make a determination about the direction of where they were going. And then they used their wings, the remaining two wings, to fly. We need to be like those angels. Think about it. Walk by faith. Not make a decision about where we're going. When this service is over today, if somebody says, let's go eat, we'll have, and there's three people standing there, we'll have three different places that will be a decision of where, where to go. We need to, in our faith, be obedient to that faith as we begin to answer this call. And he's calling all warriors. Another thing about these seraphims as we dig deeper into this, it says that the, these angels cried out, holy. And when one said holy, another said holy. And then another said holy. They said, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the angels are teaching us this, this morning. That our response when we're in the presence of God is what? Holy. It's about you, God, not me. Holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's continue to clock right through this. But these angels, as, as they were crying holy, Brother Isaiah came to a realization. In the world, they call it a, an a, epiphany. When suddenly we realize that we had a thought that we were one way, and it turns out we're really another way. That you've been going through life all this time with this misconception that you were all this and a bag of chips. And then suddenly, you realize that the emperor has no clothes. Suddenly, you realize that it, it, you're not that tough. You know, I recall there was a young man that um, uh, I was counseling at one point in life, and he had just gone through basic training. And during the, during the course of counseling, he came in once and... Um, 
his head was all swollen up and, and bruised up. And uh, he was walking with a limp. And he seemed really humble. And, and, and before, he had always seemed like very arrogant and, and very tough because he was 6'4 and about 250 and chiseled out of stone with muscle. And he, I, I, I had said to him, bro, what happened? Uh, how is it that, that it appears that you've been beat up pretty bad? Uh, what group of guys jumped on you and did this? In fact, when you tell me who it is, we're going to go get them. They're, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And he said, well, uh, leave them alone. I, I don't really want you to, to do anything about that because, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a fight. And I, I got beat up, and uh, beat up pretty bad. And then, no, we can't let this go. You, we gotta, we we gotta deal with uh, whatever happened to you. Uh, and he said, "Well, you know, Ensign Smith, for lack of, a, of another name. You know Ensign Smith." I said, "Ensign Smith, I sure do. What does he have to do with this?" It was Ensign Smith. Ensign Smith was about five two. And as humble as the day is long. And he said, I just kept pushing Ensign Smith and pushing him and pushing him. And he, and he said, I pushed him one time, and I didn't realize that Ensign Smith could hit so hard. <laughs> it was that little guy that jumped on him and beat him mercilessly. He believed that he could overcome everything. He believed he was the toughest guy around and didn't have to take anything from anybody. But he ran into something bigger than him. Isaiah believed it was woe is everybody else. But we went on to discover in the scripture today, as we prepare to be those soldiers that are being called, said, woe is me. I'm the problem. Woe is me. I'm the problem. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwelt amongst the people of unclean lips. And these very angels came, and they took a coal off the throne with the thongs and put it on his mouth and said, now you're clean. That speaks to us. And I just want to get down to the nitty-gritty of this. That speaks to us. God will send these angels that are moving by faith, not determining where they're going, and flying to you, which means speed and ability. They can go anywhere at any time. And they will come at the direction of God when we've become obedient and prepared our hearts and say, now you're in a position to be clean. And he said, now you're cleaned up. Now you're cleaned up. Now you're ready to be of service. Now you're ready to get outside yourself. Now you know that you were the problem all along. You were that 6'5 guy with chiseled muscles that ran into the 5'1 or 5'7 guy. And he helped you to find out what life was really all about. That you're not all that until God cleans you up. And now that Isaiah has discovered this in this sixth chapter, he hears the voice of God again. Are we listening? Can you hear the voice of God calling you? He hears the voice of God again saying, who is it that will go for us? A lot of people was, were prepared to stand up and say, whoa. A lot of people were in a position to say that I'm big and strong, I'm faster and smarter, but not properly prepared. So who is it that will go for us? Who will stand up, as the song says, and answer the question, yes, now that you know what God really wants from you? Your pastor had to answer that. I've had to answer that. 
And I submit the question that's been put to each and every one of us. But I'll submit the question again. Once we know what God really wants of us, you don't have to answer right now, but what will your answer be? Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. What did he say? Please send me. Here am I, Lord. Please send me. When God asks a question of you, who will go for us? Will your answer be yes? Now that you know what he really needs, he doesn't need that person that's six foot four and chiseled with muscles. He's got all the power. He needs your heart and a full commitment. If he told you what he really needs, what would your answer be? And it's easy here sitting in church to say yes. My answer is yes, Lord. But sometime between 9 and 12 o'clock, we're going to walk through that door. And we're going to head out into this world. And will you carry that yes with you out into the world? Will you? Will you read the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter of Isaiah? Because I've only told you the first one through eight verses of the sixth chapter of Isaiah. What happened after he answered yes? When God was calling this warrior and the warriors showed up for the battle and he answered yes. When you read and I ask you to read, you'll find that Isaiah was directed to go tell the people. And when he was told to go tell the people, he was told the people aren't going to listen. I have a direction for you. God has a direction for you. He has some instructions for you. He needs for you to be like those seraphims that covered their eyes and walked in faith. Isaiah put the cover over his eyes and walked in faith and obedience. Put the cover over his feet and didn't determine the direction he was going to go. Because he was also told to marry a woman of ill repute. And he obeyed. Did what God told him to do. And unfortunately for us, we're smart. So when God tells us to do something, we have to have it make sense to us. Be careful. I mean, I want this to be an uplifting message, but the message is what it is. Be ye careful. If God gives you instruction, follow the instructions. And as I stand here and think about it, if you got instructions about how to put together a Christmas tree coming out of a box, and a tree out of a box, but a Christmas tree coming out of a box, you would start at the bottom and work your way to the top, like the instructions would tell you to do. So why, when we get instructions from God, we want to start in the middle and work out to both directions? When he says, I just, all I want to do is bless you, told Isaiah to go tell these people and they wouldn't listen. Tell him to go do something with his life that he didn't understand, but he went. As a result of that, he said, now you're going to be the one to tell the world about the coming of Jesus Christ. You're going to be rewarded mightily for your faithfulness. You're going to be rewarded mightily for stepping up. You're going to be rewarded mightily for teaching Sunday school. You're going to be rewarded mightily for being a deacon. Yes, you're not going to always understand why you have to be at church every Sunday on time. But God is here now and he's watching everything. He's calling us and telling us what I really need of you is your obedience. I'm telling you what I really want. It's not a mystery. It's not a secret. This is what I really expect from you. But he will not force us to do it. So what will your answer be? What will your answer be? You know, there's another body of scripture. 
uh, that we were going to look at this morning, and I don't, I don't know the time will permit. But Gideon was told to go fight a battle, and, and 3,000 people went with him. God said, you got too many, because the people think they did it. Send, them other send, them, send most of the people home because they're cowards. They'll get to the fight, and they won't fight, and you got to fight for them. And he very selectively picked out only 300 under very particular circumstances. Being one of the selected, chosen few, it's not just the ministers, the deacons, the Sunday school teachers, and the ushers, the people that serve. It's everybody in every pew. God is speaking to every one of us. Let the church say amen. I'm not going to belabor this point with you. I have to confess, this lesson spoke to me this morning about going and serving and continue to serve under every circumstance. Continue to go to the battle and show up and fight. And when you do, God will fight with you. I have a quick story to tell. I wasn't going to tell it, but I'm going to tell it. Because the last time I told it, something happened. But when I was a little boy, I could run fast. There was another kid in the neighborhood, they called him Cadillac. And it was my, because Cadillacs were fast, it was always my intention to beat Cadillac. And it, it came a point in time when I could beat Cadillac. And I got a little bigger and a little stronger. And I'd go to the park and race with Cadillac, and we'd play football, and we'd run back and forth. I'd get a touchdown, he'd get a touchdown. We'd run over people, and people try to catch passes and break away. I'd, I'd run them down and catch them and tackle them and talk about them. Say, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Catch the pass. You ain't get the touchdown because I'll catch you. I run them down. Well, a day came that we were at the park playing football as usual. And we're beating up some fellas pretty bad. Uh, they were from another neighborhood. And they were actually a little older than we were. And I was running my mouth. Ah, you can't catch me. And running. Well, it just so happens one time they did catch me. And when they caught me, they weren't playing football anymore. They started laying hands on me. And next thing I know, I was beat up pretty good and not running the ball to the goal line. I was running Carl to home. <laughs> and these fellas were laughing, telling me to get out of what I call my park. And I went home, and I think I had whelps and knots all over me, and when I got home, my mother was there. And I came into the house crying and sniffling, Mom, these fellas down the park, they just beat me up and run me out the park, and I think they, they took my football and, and, and called the police. <laughs> my mother looked at me and said, Son, wait a minute. Wait, just wait a minute. You went down to the park, and you telling me a whole bunch of boys jumped on you, and they were bigger than you, and they beat you up, and they ran you home crying? OK. You go back to that park, and you find them boys, and you fight them boys, and then come back home. But mama! Them the same boys that just beat me up. And it's just me. So you start running now, you're going to run the rest of your life. You get out of this house and go on back down to that park. They ain't going to kill you. Go on down to that park and fight them boys. So put my hands in my dungarees. You know, we went dungarees back then. Put my hands in my dungarees and shuffled back to the park, sniffling and thinking, well, when I get to the park, I'm going to grab the first one by the throat. When I get to the second one, I'm going to kick him. I'm going to bite one. I'm going to spit on the other one. And before they can get me down, I'm going to grab him by the neck and wrestle him and then uh, fight him and kick him and bite him and, and, and hit him. And, and maybe uh, they won't kill me. So I'm going to the park, shuffling and sniffling. And I see him down at the park. And the boys look up and they see me. And I see them. And I slow down and I ease up to them at the park. And they're standing out in the field. And I pull back and I put my little dukes up. And I say, all right, 
I'm ready. <laughs> We're we going to fight. Y'all beat me up pretty good, but I'm here back, ready to fight. And I noticed the boys kind of looked and stared and looked at me. And they broke off and they started running. I was like, whoa, whoa, that's all it takes to beat these boys now to show them that I ain't scared? And then when I was just feeling all full of myself, I turned around and looked, and there was my mama with an ax handle. <laughs> she said, I just needed you to show up for the fight. You already won. Just show up for the fight. When you're called, just show up for the fight. God has already made you victorious. That's a song we, we heard this morning. He said, I just need all my friends to know I'm already victorious. Because you're a Christian, God has made you the victor. If you'll just stand up and fight, if you'll stand on the word of God, if you'll declare it in your life and in your heart, the world will see it. And they will see your mother Jesus with that axe handle saying, touch not my anointed. My mother wouldn't have killed them boys, but she would have gave them a good whooping. Jesus Christ, your big brother, says just show up for the fight. When the doctor gives you a bad diagnosis, show up for the fight. Don't back down. When your employer says you are not big enough, fast enough, strong enough, show up for the fight. He's calling all warriors. Be one of those warriors. Be an overcomer. And when you're an overcomer, you make other overcomers come forward. The enemy is going to fight. And all you need to do is show up. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I get excited about this because I've been in some fights, some horrible fights. And I can tell you that God shows up with that ax handle, <laughs> swinging it like a baseball bat, knocking down problems, knocking down no money, knocking down rent due, knocking down addiction problems. Just show up for the fight. Be that warrior. 